I'm a vision science researcher at UC San Diego. Uh, and in my lab, we use uh, stem cell biology to explore uh, human eye and vision problems. Uh, we've been doing this for a number of years, intersecting uh, stem cell biology with gene editing, which has allowed us to look at um, the human eye as it develops similar to how it would develop in an embryo. And we can also use the same sort of model to understand how the human eye falls apart during disease. We have several main focus areas in the lab, uh, which all rely on retinal degenerations in general. So the retina is a component of the eye, much like the film in a lens, uh, which has this tendency to degrade and degenerate in millions of people. And this is something that happens from everything from age-related macular degeneration to glaucoma. This really affects millions of Americans. It's a very uh, important quality of life kind of issue. But we also study more rare conditions, such as Leber's congenital amaurosis, which is a childhood onset retinal dystrophy, and uh, ocular albinism. And so these things, although they don't affect as many people, they are sort of characteristic of what happens in larger populations during age-related macular degeneration and glaucoma. So the emphasis on some of these more rare diseases is actually quite compelling. They occur much earlier in development, uh, allowing us to develop models, stem cell-based models in the lab where we can actually watch these things happen in real time. And we use gene editing in order to create the mutations that, sim that patients have. And we also use gene editing to introduce fluorescent indicators to tell us when we have the cells that we want and when those cells might be dying. What we're doing in the lab is we're investigating and exploring a new approach. And this is something which uh, happens in nature and it's called endogenous regeneration. So many species can re re uh, regenerate their limbs. They can regenerate new arms, new legs. Uh, some species, like planaria, uh, these can actually regenerate an entirely new head. So the concept of regenerating an eye using flips of a switch activating genes is something which is actually grounded in reality. And we're taking that similar approach to the human eye. Uh, recently, it was de uh, demonstrated that mice can actually do this if you trigger a certain set of genes. We're taking those same genes, we're creating the same sort of switches in the human eye, and we wanna show that we can regenerate the human eye in retinal degenerative disorders. And this would be a huge uh, benefit for the field. The idea that you can use a similar treatment to target hundreds of different gene mutations, this has broad implications that are not uh, simply directed at ocular albinism, but they're also directed at age-related macular degeneration, retinitis pigmentosa, um, all of the inherited retinal dystrophies that affect so many people worldwide. In our lab, we, uh, we've utilized a, a number of different approaches uh, to increase the throughput of our work. Uh, we use what is called high-throughput imaging. We use high-throughput screening. And for this, we need tools, and we have tools, uh, that can feed lots of samples simultaneously. And so an example of an experiment that we might do is we would use something like this, which is called a 96 well plate. And you can see that each of these has 96 samples um, and each of these becomes an individual experiment. Uh, in order to feed these samples, we have new tools that allow us to increase the throughput and take care of many of these samples all at once. So what was taking us um, hours before might take us simply just a few minutes now. And so you can see here, this is an example of how we would typically feed the cells. It's a very fast way to do it and very reproducible. From there, we would walk over to the other side of the lab where we would do the high throughput, high content imaging. And this imaging essentially allows us to view and analyze in real time in living samples, hundreds, thousands of samples. And so this type of approach here, this is called a high throughput imager. It acquires images in those 96 samples, each one treating it as a separate experiment. And then we bring it over here. After we've acquired the images, it comes to an offline workstation where we can analyze and, and view and watch these samples in real time. So this image here, what you're looking at is a, is a plate that was imaged with a green fluorescence reporter. Uh, we use gene editing in order to label cells that are living. So a green cell, for instance, tells us that we have a retina. The techniques that we use to make three-dimensional retinas in a dish 
from stem cells essentially produces a nervous system from the head up. This means that we get brains, we get retinas, we have a variety of tissues. In order to know for certainty that we have retinas growing in a dish, we need these fluorescent reporters here. And this allows us to know for sure that we have a retina instead of a brain. We have other colors that turn on. When photoreceptors turn on, which are the primary cell that respond to light, uh, a red signal will turn on. So we can watch these cells in real time as they develop over the course of many months. Uh, keep in mind, a human retina takes anywhere from six to nine months to develop. Uh, and this is just the way the human gestation is. Uh, we have the tools to image and to watch these things. If you don't have these tools, you would have to stop each experiment at every single time point and start over again after you analyze it. So now we can just watch it to the completion of the experiment. So I'm gonna give you a little uh, demonstration of a sample that we generated about three months ago. So these have been growing for about 90 days. And this, what this sample is, is this is a human retina, it's a three-dimensional retina that we've grown, but it has two different genetic reporters built in. So the first one tells us that we have retinas intact. The second one tells us that we have retinal ganglion cells. And those are the cells that die during glaucoma. So let's put this in and see what we can see. So I'm trying to find the organoid now. And yes, we have found it. Okay, so I will show you what it looks like on screen here. So what I found is a three-dimensional retina. If we look at this in regular bright field fluorescence, you can see it has this beautiful rounded shape. So this is a human retina here. Uh, this is a brain structure up here. Now we're gonna turn on the fluorescence to demonstrate that we have a green fluorescent image. And this nice white signal here indicates that the signal that the reporter has actually worked. Uh, now we're gonna switch to a different color. It looks white to you, and that's just an artifact from the microscope, but it is in fact green in the eyepiece. So now we switch to a different reporter and it has a slightly different shape and appearance. The retinal ganglion cells are actually in a very small portion of the eye, only in this area here. So again, this takes about 90 days to make. Uh, for it to really mature, we need about another 100 days as well. Uh, so these are, these are not short-term experiments, but this is really how human development occurs. These retinas, they have all of the cells that a human eye have everything from the photoreceptor which receives light to the interneurons which process this light to the ganglion cells which then send these projections to the brain. So this is really important to know that if you want a disease model or a model where you're studying human development, you actually need a human eye that has all of the right architecture, the shape, size, and all of the right organization. And that's essentially what we've built here. Uh, we're developing the tools that will allow us to regenerate different types of cells in the eye. So we study human developing eyes. We pull out all of the genes that are expressed, and then we start making prioritizing and listing which of those seem to make the most sense. Then we start using those to turn them on and turn them off as little flips, uh, flipping switches inside the cell. And that's essentially the process that we do. It's gonna be an iterative process where I think we understand how to build a photoreceptor precursor and then we understand how to generate uh, a rod photoreceptor and a cone photoreceptor. In the end, uh, there's gonna be a number of tools that we have to make in order for this to be successful. But this is cutting edge technology and that's how it is. Um, all of these ideas, uh, they generate a lot of excitement in the field. And even though we may not be able to make the viral vectors in order to deliver these genes the way we want, another group may be working on similar, a similar approach and we can use their tools as well. So we're not acting in a box here. Uh, we interact with the research community broadly. We identify tools that we can adopt for our own purposes, and then we take it from there. Um, I think it's realistic to think that we'll make a lot of progress in identifying at least the photoreceptor precursors to get uh, cone photoreceptors in place during this project. So in the next two years, uh, I'm hopeful that we'll identify factors and switches which can turn cone photoreceptors on from progenitors inside of the eye that already exist. And if we can do that, I think that would be a huge um, benefit and bonus for the field. 
I think it's something that we can definitely work with. Um, I should also point out um, that these are not really lofty goals in the sense that you know, they may or may not work. I really do think that they will work. It has been shown in zebrafish to work already. It has worked in mice and we can cure a lot of diseases in mice. It's just when you get to the human stage, uh, things tend to uh, slow down quite a bit because we don't have good models to test these tools. The human 3D organoids actually are the perfect model. It's a human tissue. It has all the biology of a human, of a human being and it's accessible. We can do anything we want to it without ethical considerations, without harming a patient. You can't test these things on people, but you can test them on organoids. So I think that's really uh, the benefit of the work that we're proposing here. So I think that the concept of endogenous regeneration is a really exciting area um, that is really understudied. I think the fact that so many species can regenerate tissues, but we really can't, uh, it tells us something really profound that we really need to focus on this. And if we understand how this process works, uh, this has much broader implications for curing diseases beyond the retina. This is the kind of thing that applies to Alzheimer's disease where you may need to regenerate new brain neurons or Parkinson's disease where you need to generate new neurons of the substantia nigra. There's lots of different approaches that this kind of technology could be used for. So understanding how to take an existing cells prime them to think that they're being injured and then activate a series of genes. This is a broad implication to many different research areas. I think this is groundbreaking technology that, that the regenerative medicine field will be adopting in the next few years because it's just such a powerful technique.